Well, good morning. We are excited because the Lord willing, we'll be meeting in person at New Prospect Baptist Church this Sunday. But we are continuing to record the videos um, right now for the sake of those who aren't able to be with us. And we are in the book of James. We're making our way through that. We are in James chapter 5, 7 through 12, which is about patience and suffering. In fact, if we said if you have an ESV, you'll see that's the way it's labeled, patience and suffering. And I said last week it would take us about three times to get through this passage, Lord willing. And upon further study this week, I think it's going to take us about four times to get through this step by step. And so just to catch us up to speed with where we're at, uh, in James chapter 5, the first part, James had a warning to the wicked, unbelieving rich. And he, he closed that section talking about the way that they were mistreating the righteous people. They were persecuting the righteous people. And he's already alluded to that uh, back in chapter 2. And so now he shifts in verse 7 to encourage those righteous sufferers. So in context, what James is writing is going to apply to folks that are under suffering from the wicked rich. Uh, the principles we're going to look at, though, I think apply to any suffering pretty much. But specifically in context, we want to remember he's writing to people that are suffering persecution. And so let's read the passage and then we'll give a recap of what we looked at last time and we'll move forward. Uh, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Be patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Well, we said that in this passage, what James is doing is he's giving us things he wants us to remember. And he'll say, remember this or look at this. And in light of that, here's what I want you to do. He's actually going to give us uh, six things. And we looked at the first two last week. We said, first of all, remember the fruit. I could have said the, the farmer and the fruit. God's not done yet, so be patient. Remember the farmer, remember the fruit. God's not done yet, so be patient. We talked about there are early rains and there are late rains. Christ has come once, but he's ascended to the Father. He is coming again, and we're in that in-between time that the Bible calls the last days. And there's still fruit to come. Sometimes we see the fruit of our labors in the Lord in this life, and other times we see it in the life to come. So be patient. Then we also talked about remember the coming. It's soon. So be patient and establish your hearts. Remember the coming, it's soon. So be patient and establish your heart. Sometimes we have to preach to ourselves, remind ourselves of what is true and the way we should respond to this truth. We talked about how that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And so if you count it that way, a thousand years being as a day, it's only been two days since the Lord left. And the Lord is patient because he wants to see people come to repentance. Well, now we come to verse uh, verse 9. We'll look at it again together. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And that's the verse we want to look at this morning. Let me just give you the point, and then we'll unpack it together, Lord willing. Uh, here's the point. Remember who is judge. He's at the door. So don't grumble against each other. Remember who is judge. He's at the door. So don't grumble against each other. Okay? First of all, we need to remember who is judge. Who's the judge? God is the judge. Not me, not you. It's God. He is the judge. When it says he's at the door, um, what's that mean? Well, it's, it'd be a reference to he, his coming is any moment. Any moment. 
and don't grumble against each other. Uh, the word for grumble here, that's how the ESV, the New King James, the NLT, and the Net Bible all translate it. The New American Standard and the CSB translate it complain. And the King James Version translates it grudge not one against another. So you're getting the idea of what the word means here. And it seems that in context, what James is talking about is that in times of persecution, in times of suffering, one of the temptations that we face is that we can begin to grumble against each other. And that's what he's saying. In the midst of this persecution that you're dealing with, in the midst of this suffering, don't grumble against one another. Brothers, even underlines it, that the unity that they have, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Now, James is concerned about this. Um, James, as we've seen throughout the, past, throughout the book, throughout our study together, he is very passionate. But one of the reasons he's so passionate about some of these things is because he knew what it was like to have someone doing these negative things toward him, or he was the one that had done these negative things toward someone else. And he deeply regretted his own sin, and he wants uh, to spare you and I those same mistakes, you and me, those same mistakes. So, for example, uh, James knew what it was like to be guilty of grumbling against a brother in the midst of uh, suffering, especially suffering for that brother. Uh, if you want to turn to the book of John, we have referenced this passage before, but I think in light of our, our study this morning, we need to review it. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Remember, we believe that uh, Jesus is born of, of Mary whenever Mary, Mary was a virgin. It was a miraculous birth. Um, God is the one who created the body there. The Old Testament prophesied this. Behold, a body you have prepared for me. And the New Testament quotes that as well. Uh, but after Jesus was born, um, certainly Joseph and Mary had normal marital relations and there were other children born. And James is one of those. And Jesus had brothers. He had sisters. And so we pick it up in chapter 7 of John. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. So the religious leaders are mad at this point. It seems they're jealous of him and they're seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booth was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. They're, they're mocking him. They're trying to get him in trouble. Verse 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. And Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. And the situation is heating up here. In fact, if you look down in verse um, 12, it even says, or verse 13, yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. So the, the Jewish religious leaders are um, jealous of Jesus, it seems, and they're persecuting him. Um, and so here's what happens. If you're one of Jesus' brothers, how does this impact you? Because if you're one of Jesus' brothers, you're either, it seems, filled with jealousy or fear. You see, they're associated with greatness, but they're not the greatness. And so perhaps there was jealousy as the crowds came and the accolades came. But the other thing that happens is uh, there's the suffering as the religious leaders are, are turning against Jesus. And I, you guys, I think most of you know this, but for anyone who maybe knew the Bible, let me make it clear, Jesus is Jewish. So it talks about the Jews here. Um, it's talking about the Jewish religious leaders that are turning against him. And in that case, the brothers potential, face potential suffering because they are Jesus' brothers. Imagine what it's like. Those who adore Jesus may come to them and be like, oh, you're Jesus, brother. 
Those who hate Jesus may say something like, Oh, you're Jesus, brothers. See? And what happens? They begin to grumble against Jesus. Of course, thank the Lord, we know that after the resurrection, James became a believer in Jesus. But James know what it, knows what it's like to be guilty of grumbling against a brother. He wants to spare you and I that sin, to spare you and I that regret. We're not to grumble against one another. We're to seek unity. Listen, especially in a time of suffering, um, we don't need a war against each other. We already are at war with the world, the flesh, and the devil. We don't want to be at war with each other. Listen, we're a part of the body. I hope my hand doesn't start, start attacking my arm, okay? Instead, it's to help my arm, all right? Um, let's look at some verses together. Uh, turn to the book of Philippians. Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 2. And we'll look at verses 14 and 16 together. Paul writes, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So, Whenever you and I live this out, people are going to notice a difference and said, in fact, people will know we are Christians. We're supposed to know we're Christians by the way we love each other. We're supposed to love each other the way Christ loved us, not be grumbling against one another. You can think about it um, if you've ever worked in a workplace um, where there are unsafe people and you're around them. You've probably seen this happen where there can be some grumbling or backbiting that and if you're just a loving sincere person who's trying to encourage people they notice that difference you shine like a light in the world turn to the book of, of romans it's right after the book of acts matthew mark luke john acts romans chapter 13 verses 11 through 14 besides this you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. In other words, we're closer to the Lord coming back. We're closer to the full realization of what salvation means for you and me. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies. Some people would say, well, of course not. And drunkenness, again, some would say, well, of, of course not. We know better than that. Not in sexual immorality and sensuality. Again, well, of course not. We're Christians. Then he says, not in quarreling and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Listen, we must not give in to the temptation to tear someone else down, to grumble against them, to somehow lift ourselves up in the eyes of others. That's not proper. Um, instead, we need to humble ourselves. Make no provision for the flesh. We take these things seriously. Now turn to the book of Hebrews. It's just before the book of James. The book of Hebrews. And look at verse 12, chapter 12, excuse me. And verse 14. Strive. Notice that word. It's a strong word. Strive for peace with everyone. And for the holiness, that's the set-apartness, without which no one will see the Lord. All right? So we're to strive for this peace, to strive to live out being the otherness that we've been given. In Christ, you've been given holiness, and we're to live out that holiness. And as we live out um, God's ways, 
we know him better and better. We see the Lord better and better for who he is. But we're to strive for this. It means we try at this, to not grumble, but to strive for peace. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. When it's time to pray, um, burn, put the cell phone down, turn the TV off, this kind of thing. Self-controlled. Be sober in your, in your prayers, for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. This is what's supposed to describe us, to love one another earnestly. If we love one another earnestly, it's going to, in our hearts, then it's going to affect our lips, and we won't grumble against one another. Well, turn to the book of Romans, chapter 12. The book of Romans, chapter 12. Uh, this idea of not grumbling against one another, but instead being encouraging and living out the unity that we've been given there may be, if this was a classroom, I imagine someone in the back going, okay, I got a question. Because surely there has to be a way to express um, a, a disagreement in a way that's appropriate. Or what about when you're, you're just, you're trying to get along, you're striving to get along, you're trying to be encouraging, you're, you're not trying to not grumble, but a situation just seems unworkable. What then? Well, the book of Romans addresses this. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 18. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Notice that. Give thought. You think about your actions before you do them. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. So, on the one hand, if we're seeking to do the right thing and someone doesn't like it, well, we do the right thing anyway. Okay, it's too bad. It's the right thing to do. We honor God. On the other hand, let's say there's two legitimate options in our minds about the way to handle something. But we give thought to it and we realize that option A seems fine to us, but it's going to be offensive to someone else. Well, there's an option B that's acceptable to us. And it's not offensive to someone else. Seems like we should go with option B. Again, he says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. We don't live selfishly. Verse 18, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, notice that. If possible means sometimes it's just not possible. All right? So far as it depends on you, meaning there's only so much you can do to live peaceably with all. Sometimes that's just not possible. And if you find yourself in a situation uh, with a Christian brother or sister, and you're doing everything you know to do to not grumble against them. You're trying to do the right thing, but something arises, and it's a legitimate issue. I mean, it's a sin issue. It's not right. It, it, listen, God is for peace, yes, but God is also for justice. And so, a situation arises that has to be dealt with. You've tried to live peaceably, and it's just not happening. Um, you've done your part, and it's still not resolved. What do we do? Well, then, we go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18 deals very directly with this. Verses 15 through 20. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, like an unbeliever. 
Truly, I say to you, well, well, that's where we need to stop. Sorry, sorry to go on. So the Bible deals with this. When there's a situation, you've tried your best and it's just not resolved. There is a process for us to go through. Take someone, first of all, go one-on-one. If that doesn't work and the person doesn't listen, they're persisting in their sin or whatever the issue is, then you go and you get uh, one or two to come with you. And if they still don't listen then, then you go to the church to deal with it. And if they won't listen to the church leadership at that point, then you consider them an unbeliever. Let's uh, back to the book of James. And we'll go through the rest of this verse here. Uh, back in the book of James, he's talking about not, he says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Well, what does he mean, so that you may not be judged? Well, he's talking to, first of all, it seems he's talking to Christians here. He says, brothers, he's addressing them as brothers. So, so what's going on here? I mean, we know from Romans 8.1 that there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Uh, that if you have placed your faith in Christ, if you believe that Jesus is God, who came in flesh, lived the perfect life that you and I never could, that he took our place on the cross, he died in our place taking our sin and the death it deserves, and he rose again three days later, ascended to the Father 40 days later, and he's coming back again. If you believe that, and you've accepted his gift of righteousness, he offers you his righteousness, if you've accepted that, if you call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, then you are what we call saved. You're a, a believer. And so the Bible says there's no condemnation for you, meaning no eternal condemnation. Uh, there is heaven, there is hell. And if you believe in Jesus, you are not going to hell. That is a settled matter. In fact, the, the book of Philippians says that he who began a good work in you will complete it. So once a person places their faith in Jesus, truly places their faith in Jesus, they are eternally secure in him. And so what does it mean then? What kind of judgment is he talking about? Well, there's two possibilities here. And the first is that in this life, uh, God corrects his children. He spanks them because he loves them. All right. Uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11, he writes this. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. In other words, a true believer, if he starts to go off into sin, God will um, correct him. There's going to be divine discipline. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So God uses discipline in the believer's life to help train them in living out the righteousness that they were given through the cross of Christ. And so what James, one possible mean of, of James here is he's saying, look, don't grumble against each other so that God doesn't have to give you a whooping. All right? Uh, you know, straighten up uh, is what he's saying. Another possible reference here is the judgment would be this. A, it's, a, it's a loss of potential rewards, a loss of potential rewards. Rewards. Turn to the book of First Corinthians uh, and look at chapter three. First Corinthians chapter three. We are saved by faith and faith alone, not by our works. Our works would never earn salvation. Our works don't save us. Our works don't keep us. We're saved by faith, and God keeps us. Uh, but our works are tried for rewards uh, in eternity. Look at First Corinthians. Chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. Paul writes, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. 
For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Okay, in other words, if you were to describe your works for the Lord, would it be, um, how, how would you describe it here? Would it be gold, silver, precious stones, or would it be wood, hay, and straw? He says, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Listen, if, if a Christian is guilty of grumbling against his brother, then yes, he stands in danger of God's discipline in his life to straighten him up, conform him to the image of Christ. But he also faces the loss of some eternal rewards. Because every moment we're in, we have a choice of what we're doing, investing in eternity or merely investing in now. And so there is that kind of judgment that James perhaps has in mind. There is another kind of judgment that James may have in mind. He's talking here to brothers, but we've also noticed that throughout the book, James over and over again, he is addressing them as Christians, as believers, most of the time. But he also challenges them to examine their faith, to make sure they really believe that they truly possess faith in their heart and haven't just professed it with their mouth. Because there are people that profess faith, but they don't really believe. And they go off and live however, and God doesn't discipline them because they're not his to begin with. Okay? And the Bible warns us in 1 John about those who went out from us because they were not of us. They weren't truly Christians. So there's a warning here to kind of check themselves to make sure they are a believer. In fact, turn to the book of Titus, Titus chapter 3, and look at verses 10 to 11. As for a person who stirs up division, and one of the ways you could stir up division is by grumbling, okay? A person that's constantly grumbling against brothers, and they grumble about this brother to that brother, and they grumble about this brother to that brother, and they're divisive. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. It's kind of letting them know not to worry when they have to pronounce this judgment. They don't need to feel sorry for this person because they've condemned themselves through their own actions. Now, we still feel sorry for anyone, even in their sin, but the, the judgment here is just, is the point. And so there is a warning here. There is a warning to, if a person is guilty of grumbling against brothers or causing division, they need to check themselves to make sure they are truly saved to begin with. He says, Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Revelation 22.20 20 says this, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. When it says he's at the door, I, I thought of uh, when I was in high school, and I was I, I, had, I had fantastic teachers in high school, and I was thinking about um, whenever Mrs. Hughes or Mrs. Weeby or Mrs. Hall would need to leave the classroom for something. And uh, they would leave. Maybe they had to go to the office or go talk to another teacher, and they would leave. And, and what happens whenever a teacher leaves the classroom? I mean, they've given you instructions, what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to be working on. They step out for a moment. Well, some of the students begin to get squirmy. This one begins to talk to that one. That one begins to talk to this one. Maybe something gets thrown. I, I remember being in a class before, and, and it gets so loud, you think, good grief, what is wrong with you guys? Don't you, do you not realize you're going to get caught? <laughs> and then what happens? The teacher comes back in. And I can remember um, the line uh, one of the teachers um, that I had said, uh, you know, uh, 
or sometimes we knew, depending on where you're sitting in the class, you could see them. They were at the door. They were just on the other side of the door and the, the door had a window and they're just on the other side of the door. They can hear everything that's being said. In fact, I remember one of the teachers, I think it may have been, maybe Mrs. Hall coming back in and saying, I could hear every word you were saying. Um, if you've ever been in that situation, if you were the kid trying to do the right thing, you were very glad when the teacher came back and there was a vindication, right? Um, well, the judge, not just, he is our teacher, but he's also the judge. And he's at the door. And it's a good thing for those of us who believe. We must not grumble with one another. We are not the judge. Instead, we're to be known by our reasonableness with each other. We're to be known by the grace we show one another. We're to show each other the grace that God has shown us. In Philippians 4, 5, Paul writes this, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do you notice how he connects those two ideas? That we're to be reasonable and the Lord is at hand. Listen, it's urgent that we show people Christ in our actions, that we seek to win them to Christ. And one of the ways that happens is the way you and I as believers treat one another. They should be able to see the love that we have for each other and say, I want what they have. What kind of picture of Christ's love are we showing the world? Let me kind of apply this in a couple different ways for us, um, just specifically with where we are at. Um, one of the things I do on a pretty regular basis is check out some what's called discernment blogs. Um, guys that are writing about some of the issues going on within Christianity. And sometimes those are very helpful. They help us help me uh, be up on the news and what's going on and some of the issues our denomination is, is facing. But every now and then, I'll, re I'll read an article, and Ronnie and I will talk about it and be like, I think they're being a little bit too critical here. Now, there's a difference between standing for righteousness, which we're supposed to do, and striving for correct doctrine. Now, there's a difference between that and just being too picky and not giving each other the benefit of a doubt, not seeking to, as the Bible says, love hopes all things. And so we want to be careful that we don't cross that line and grumble against one another. I also thought where we're at as we film this, we're in the midst of COVID. And different churches are responding to this different ways. Different people have different opinions. Um, some believers feel as though this is persecution against the church. Other believers say, no, it's not persecution against the church at all. All massive gatherings have been asked to uh, shut down. Um, and then others are somewhere in the middle going, I don't think that some of this is persecution, but I see where it could be that way. And in some situations, it may be if the churches aren't allowed to open, but these other things are. It's, it's a complicated situation. And so like right now, in one state, you have one pastor uh, choosing to meet with his church in a tent outside, which is abiding by that state's guidelines. You have another well-known, well-loved pastor who said, um, this man is unconstitutional, we're going to meet, and we're going to meet in the auditorium, and that's the decision they've made. But listen, this is a time we want to be careful that we don't grumble against one another. We can have conversations, but we need to be sure that we do them peacefully and respectfully and not grumble against each other. What, what concerns me is when a pastor in one location will say, this is the way we're doing it, and this is the way everybody should do it. Not necessarily, because somewhere else it may be a totally different situation. Uh, this We need to show grace with one another. You know, thank the Lord, New Prospect, Lord willing, we're able to open up this Sunday and, and be together. Uh, praise the Lord. But I'm certainly not going to grumble against another church if they're not to where they can do that yet. Uh, maybe they don't have the ability to spread out like we do in our facility or whatever the reason may be. But let's be careful during this time. This is a time of suffering, whatever it is. It is a time of suffering. And we want to be sure that we don't grumble against one another. We want to be sure that we are seeking to think the best of each other and do what is best for each other and encourage one another. And in all things, may Christ be glorified and may his love be seen and may people be one 
to him. Let me just close with this idea. In Revelation 12, 10, Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. But Jesus is called our advocate. He's our advocate. Think of 1 John 2, 1. And in fact, even in the oldest book of the Bible, um, not the first book, but the oldest book, the book of Job, let me read you a passage here from chapter 16, and verse 19. Job says, Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven. He who testifies for me is on high. So Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Jesus is the advocate. Who do you want to be like? I don't want to be like Satan. Let's not be the accuser of the brethren. Let's not grumble against one another. Instead, let's be like Jesus. Let's seek to advocate for each other, to encourage one another as we pursue to live out the righteousness that was won for us at the cross. We love you. We can't wait to see you. And we're praying for you. Lord, thank you so much that you who have the right to pronounce judgment on us instead chose to take our judgment for us at the cross. You bore your own righteous, perfect anger so that we could be at peace with you. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, may we show that same love, that same forgiveness, that same grace toward one another. Lord, help us to have honest conversations. Help us to hold each other accountable to live out your word. But may we not self-righteously grumble against one another. Lord, you alone are judge. I thank you so much for the unity and the love that you have given us in New Prospect Baptist Church. And we pray that you would just continue to... Um, expand that and we thank you for it lord may we honor you in all things in jesus name amen we love you